Marijuana, Chapter 11. This is the full video of my lecture for the Substance Use Disorder Counseling and Chemical Dependency classes. In this video, we will examine the origin of marijuana. We'll talk about some of its history and the problems we currently face given marijuana's changing status in American society. This video is by David Joel Miller. Some of the material originally appeared as posts on the counselorsoapbox.com blog. The photos are courtesy of Pixabay and Wikimedia Commons and licensed under the Creative Commons license, uh, no attribution required. Marijuana, the plant. Marijuana is classified as cannabis sativa and is the hemp plant. It's been harvested for a very long time for fiber. It can be used to make rope, clothes, and ship sails. Only recently has it been used for psychoactive properties. In the wild, plants from warmer climates produce more resin, therefore have stronger THC uh, content and more psychoactive properties. Some authorities separate the plant into two species, while others consider them varieties of one species. The early history of marijuana. At least 10,000 years ago, it was used for pots and sandals on the island of Taiwan. By 2,800 years before the current era, it was used medicinally in China. In India, it was used in Hindu religious ceremonies, and the use spread from that area to the Middle East and then North Africa. Hashish, which is re the resin removed from the plant, was used in Arab countries and imported into Egypt. Cannabis in the New World was originally brought by the Spanish to Chile. It was introduced to North America for fiber. In fact, in some places in New England, there were requirements that each person raise a certain number of acres of hemp. Uh, it was used for both rope and sails for all of those wooden sailing ships. As the westward expansion took place, it was a major crop in Kentucky and a core crop in, throughout that area until after the U.S. Civil War. Cannabis is a psychoactive drug. While in the northern states, it was largely used for fiber, in the southern states, we began to see a, a use of cannabis, marijuana, as a psychoactive drug. Notice in the DSM, there is no marijuana use disorder, but it's listed as cannabis use disorder because of its many uh, varieties and ways it's prepared. Cannabis or marijuana was used in the south by Mexican farm workers. Uh, in the southern part of the Yucatan, that area, uh, the use of marijuana had been adopted by Native American populations. And as many of them came up to the United States in the southern states, um, Texas, Arizona, that area, uh, they brought this use with them. One of the places where there was an increased use in marijuana was in New Orleans by dock workers. At that point in U.S. history, there were no road systems that did not come until the 1950s after World War II. And even in the earlier days, there were no train systems. So the bulk of goods moved by riverboat up the Mississippi and then spread out through the Missouri and the Ohio and the other rivers. So New Orleans was a major center of the distribution via the river system. There was a critical shortage of dock workers. In those days, there were no forklifts and there were no uh, trucks to pull things off the ships. So the cargo that came, arrived at the port in New Orleans, was carried off the ships on the backs of uh, dock workers. There was a big shortage of dock workers in that area, and they got the workers from the islands in the Caribbean, Cuba, Jamaica, and so on, Many of those workers were uh, African-American. 
So they brought with them their history, their custom of smoking marijuana. As uh, that progressed, the use of marijuana spread north along the river. Later on, the United States got a rail system and with uh, trains going from the East Coast down to New Orleans, many white college students would go to New Orleans for the Mardi Gras. Well, there they were introduced to the use of marijuana and they took often took packages, bags of the wacky weed back with them to their schools on the East Coast. In those days, there was no prohibition against smoking tobacco in class, and therefore, students began to smoke marijuana openly right there on campus. Well, this horrified many people on the East Coast because their belief was that uh, this was something only black people did, and seeing white college students smoking marijuana, the fear was they would begin to change into black people, if not physically in their culture and behavior. So as the use spread north, it became more controversial. During Prohibition, the 1920s, as alcoholic beverage places closed, uh, they were replaced on the East Coast by tea pads. And during the 1920s, there were over 500 tea pads in the Harlem part of New York City alone, places where people would go to smoke marijuana or use other hashish or other cannabis products. Marijuana use became an issue. Originally, it was used mostly by black Americans. And at that point, it wasn't considered a cause for concern. But as the use spread into the white community, it became more of an issue. Anslinger, head of the Bureau of Narcotics, campaigned for laws regulating marijuana. And many states began to restrict trafficking in marijuana. Once prohibition was repealed, there were a lot of people who had been involved in the enforcement of prohibition who now had nothing to do or very little. And so uh, Anslinger pushed to have marijuana made illegal. In 1937 came the passage of the Marijuana Tax Act. Many of you know that the power to tax is also the power to destroy. And taxes and regulations under the Marijuana Tax Act were so strict, doctors needed a expensive Marijuana Tax Act stamp uh, on their tax returns to even be allowed to prescribe it, that eventually it reached the point where there was only one doctor left in the United States who could legally prescribe marijuana when he stopped uh, that was the end of legal marijuana. From 1937 to about 1969, uh, there was a particular way of looking at marijuana in the United States. There were heavy penalties for possession or sales. In some places, uh, people could get up to life in prison or even the death sentence. But then in the 1960s, there was increased use by the counter culture. Notice that early part, the, the 1965 to 70 part, uh, was also coupled with the anti-war protests. And so the use of marijuana was also uh, identified, associated with those people who opposed the government. Since 1970, uh, uh, there have been uh, efforts to reduce penalties, decriminalize medical marijuana, and legalize it only for recreational use. Uh, that ran counter to the programs for zero tolerance and the war on drugs, which filled our prisons with people mainly based on drug charges. And many of those people who got harsh prison sentences uh, back in the 1970s, it was largely for uh, possession or sales of marijuana. But there's still a problem. It is still on Schedule I federally illegal for any doctor to prescribe in the United States, having no accepted recognized medical value. Epidemiology. Marijuana is the most widely used illicit drug in the Western world, the third most commonly used recreational drug after alcohol and tobacco. Of course, that drug research excludes 
the accepted drug caffeine. Methods of use or routes of administration have varied widely, and each of these has its pros and cons. It's been ingested in India for centuries in beverages and in food, uh, common there to make tea from the marijuana leaves. The leaves can be chewed. Uh, in other areas in our culture, smoking was often joints, joints being hand-rolled marijuana cigarettes. It can be smoked in water pipes. Uh, there's some cautions about water pipes. Many people think because you smoke it in a water pipe, it's less dangerous. There's some truth that it, the cooling of the water, uh, less likely to burn the lungs, less likely to have a lot of tar accumulate, which is a carcinogen, but the water can quickly grow fungus and fungal infections are possible. And most people don't know how to properly sterilize water pipes. Recently, we've seen a trend of smoking uh, something called blunts. Blunts are cigar wrappers, sometimes cigarette, cigars cut open and the tobacco replaced with marijuana so that they're uh, the equivalent of smoking a marijuana cigar. Smoking methods all have increased health risks. Uh, also in the medical marijuana field, we see edibles in which the marijuana is placed into food. It's the smoking that harms the lungs because it places tar into the lungs and marijuana, the tar from marijuana, is more of a carcinogen than the tar from tobacco. The research on marijuana is contradictory, and that's not just because of the biases of researchers. Uh, one of the biggest problems is that marijuana is not a specific chemical. It is a stew consisting of many chemicals. Think about it if you said you were being served stew for dinner, and it was beef stew, or if it was Brussels sprouts vegetarian stew, the results would be different. And the results of research can depend on the strain of marijuana and the way it was grown or harvested, and also user characteristics. There's much we do not yet know about all the stew's ingredients. In fact, the research comes in daily. Uh, at the very end of this presentation, I'm going to introduce a new piece of research I just found within the last week or so. So what are the active ingredients, the chemicals in the marijuana leaves and plant? More than 400 chemicals have been identified in marijuana. Uh, at least 60 cannabinoids, one book that we use for some of our classes here at the college, uh, Buzz says there's 116. The more books I look at, the more numbers I get. THC, tetrahydrocannabinoid, is the one that gets people high, and it's the one that most people are talking about when they discuss marijuana. However, a second uh, con common cannabinoid in marijuana, cannabis, is CBD, and that has been largely identified with medicinal properties. Remember, various strains of the plant can produce varying levels of THC and CBD and also the other cannabinoids. Uh, recently, there have been warnings about excessive use even of the uh, high CBD products because uh, at high levels, there seems to be some physical withdrawal symptoms and also nausea that has taken people to hospital emergency rooms. Potency of cannabis. Older types, those of the old hippies were smoking back in the 60s, probably ran about 2% THC. Uh, since Amelia, without seed culture, has gotten it up to 10 to 20%. I've heard reports, seen research from uh, Colorado, where it's now recreationally legal, that the level may be reaching 30% or more. Other cannabis products, hashish, has even a higher potency. Hash oil, which is removed using solvents, getting all of the resin out of the leaves, may reach 60% THC. Certainly taking a dose of any chemical, any drug uh, that 
goes from 2% to 60%, that's a 30 per times increase, will have different results as the concentration, the strength of the drug increases. Pharmacokinetics, smoking. Absorption depends on the mode of consumption. Smoking, as with all drugs, is the most rapid. Because the cannabinoids are lipid or fat soluble, uh, their absorption is slower. Peak concentrations happen about 30 to 60 minutes after smoking. Effects are frequently experienced for two to four hours after smoking. Remember, however, most users stack doses. That is, they smoke again long before the initial dose has been removed from the body. Some other factors that affect the marijuana smoking experience. One is the potency of THC in the particular product someone is smoking. Second is time the smoke is held in lungs. Novice marijuana smokers often report it does very little. They have to learn the process of taking a, a big drag, a big puff in, and holding it in their lungs for a while for the uh, ingredients, the chemicals, to be absorbed into their bloodstream. Also, when it's done socially, the way in the old days uh, a single joint would be passed around to a group of people, the more people sharing, the less of the active ingredient each person takes in. The pharmacokinetics of oral use is different, and this oral use is the way that it is most commonly used for medical benefits. Oral use absorbs much more slowly, relatively inefficient. Peak levels occur two to three hours after ingestion. The blood goes through the liver before reaching the brain. This results in reducing the level of THC and the effect on the brain. The experience uh, is lasts longer, four to six hours, and it requires about three times as much to reach the same effect, the same level in the bloodstream. Distribution, metabolism, and excretion. Cannabinoids are highly lipid solid. They do not dissolve well in water. Blood plasma levels of THC drop rapidly. THC deposits in fat cells, especially in the organs. High levels of THC develop in the brain, the lungs, the kidney, and the liver. And THC readily crosses the placental barrier, meaning that the unborn, the fetus, is going to get a higher dose for a longer period of time than the woman smoking. More about distribution, metabolism, and excretion. The cannabinoids are metabolized primarily in the liver, though they may be metabolized in other organs. They're excreted in both the urine and in the feces. Some metabolites can be detected 30 days after ingesting a single dose, can be detected in urine for several weeks, uh, or in my experience, even longer after chronic use. Uh, many of our clients who come into uh, residential drug treatment initially test positive for marijuana. And depending on their body weight and how long and frequently they've been smoking, it can take quite some time for their levels in their urine to drop to zero or an undetectable amount. THC's mechanism of action. Marijuana affects acetylcholine receptors, which are connected to memory. It inhibits a variety of neurotransmitters. It does release serotonin, which changes mood and perception of time and space, changes dopamine levels, uh, uh, and affects movement. There are specific anandamide receptors uh, that uh, are activated by uh, the CB receptors. Two kinds of cannabinoid receptors, more have been discovered since the original two. CB1 controls memory, cognition, motor system, and mood. CB2 affects the immune system, and there is increased blood flow in parts of the brain. 
Recently, we've seen the phenomena of designer cannabis that is synthetic, and it's possible to make these cannabinoids synthetically. Uh, more, they're more potent CB1 agonists. These have resulted in emergency room visits for elevated heart rate, high blood pressure, drowsiness, agitation, vomiting, paranoia, loss of physical control, and at high levels causes damage to the kidney function. A lot of people thought that because it was a synthetic, it would not show on drug tests, but drug test manufacturers have been working to be able to detect it and just because it didn't show on drug tests has not proven it to be safe. THC tolerance and dependence. Tolerance increases with stronger marijuana and use over more time. Dependence is associated with heavy sustained use. And dependence can include sleep disturbance, nausea, irritability, and restlessness after stopping use. Medicinal and psychotherapeutic use. There is ancient medical use in China. Childbirth in Egypt and Assyria were used that way. In Ireland, Dr. William Munch in 1838 recommended marijuana to treat rheumatism, pain, rabies, convulsion, and cholera. U.S. medical books recommended marijuana for hysteria, mental depression, DTs, insanity, as well as Dr. Munch's recommendations. These medical books largely were in effect before the U.S. Civil War. One thing that went unnoticed uh, by many people during the debate about legalizing marijuana is that THC has been available in a synthetic form uh, in a pill for a very long time. And synthetics are Schedule three drugs. Uh, I've listed several, four of them here. They can be prescribed by a doctor. Uh, they were used largely for chemotherapy patients. There have been ongoing efforts to legalize ma marijuana for medical use and more recently for recreational use and the status varies from state to state. Current medical uses, nausea and vomiting, especially from chemotherapy, uh, the wasting away often uh, that comes with HIV or cancer. It's been recommended for treatment of glaucoma. However, non-THC meds actually seem to work better. And there's plenty of antidotal use uh, reported for many, many other medical issues or con conditions. Here's some of the physiological effects of THC. The acute effects can be different for different users. There can be cardiovascular effects, bloodshot eyes, sluggish reaction to light, increased heart rate, increased pulse, elevated blood pressure, a decrease in motor activity, talkativeness, drowsiness, and changes in sleep stages, particularly less REM sleep. The longer term effects are more likely to be respiratory. Uh, marijuana has more tar and, and more of a cancer risk than tobacco. Also, marijuana is typically smoked without a filter that would catch a lot of that tar. Um, Longer term effects may have stronger impacts on the cardiovascular system, uh, probably because it's being smoked and uh, reducing the amount of oxygen in the bloodstream. There are reports that it has an effect on the immune system. Remember the CB2 receptors affect the immune system. The reproductive system may be affected and it seems to affect both genders decreased sperm and sperm motility, the poor little guys are stoned and just don't want to swim, uh, can result in non-ovulary periods for the women, and uh, that it does not mean marijuana should be used as a form of birth control, because even though the woman is not aware of uh, producing the eggs in her period, uh, she can still get pregnant. 
And there seems to be a uh, distinct syndrome of effects on infants who are born because the mother was uh, smoking or uh, because they are getting high levels of THC in the mother's breast milk. Some of the effects on the unborn, THC readily crosses the placenta and causes premature birth, shorter body length, lower infant birth weight, increased risk of some childhood cancers, a startle response right from birth, altered visual response, attention problems at age six, hyperactivity and delinquency increases at age 10 or by age 10, and cognitive defects and poorer school performance. Three kinds of psychological effects, behavioral, cognitive, and emotional. Let's look at the behavioral psychological effects of marijuana, THC in particular. Decreased movement and performance, relaxation, a sense of well-being, stage of being excited and restless, more intense perceptions of touch, hearing, vision, and smell, decreased sensitivity to pain when intoxicated. Also, decreased driving skill, increased risk of a crash, impaired judgment and concentration. The sexual effects are very poorly understood, can cause or has been connected with temporary impotence in men and decreased sex drive in women. Cognitive, some psychological effects, impaired short-term memory, perception time is moving more slowly, impairment in short-term memory even at very low doses, altered creativity, feelings of unreality, increased meaning to things not previously seen as important. Aspects of memory are affected, both the encoding, the consolidation, and the retrieval. Psychological effects of an emotional nature include alteration in mood. It's generally thought of as pleasant, though some people experience it as unpleasant. Negative feelings that are common include anxiety, dysphoria, which is a, a mixture of feelings, feeling unwell or unhappy. Somatic consequences include headache, nausea, and muscle tension. There are mental health outcomes, suspiciousness and paranoia, an increased risk of psychosis even in light users. The younger first use of marijuana, the younger the psychotic symptoms develop. Social and environmental effects. There's a thing called a motivational syndrome in which there's some question whether people who smoke marijuana simply lose all motivation and drive to do anything. The classic uh, stereotype is the surfer laying on the beach who doesn't even go out to ride the waves because they're sitting there smoking marijuana. Research is unclear as to whether smoking marijuana makes you unmotivated or whether people who are unmotivated just sit around and smoke a lot of marijuana. There are reports of increased social skills and people feel more competent in social situations. Smoking marijuana has been uh, attributed to a reduction in anxiety. There's no causal link uh, related to aggression or violence. People who smoke marijuana are not likely to uh, have an interest in being aggressive or violent. Neurotransmission is always an important question when we look at drugs. For the longest time, we couldn't find a receptor in the brain that marijuana could be affecting. Therefore, it didn't make sense that people would change their thinking, feeling, and behavior while smoking marijuana. Then, the discovery of anandamide uh, changed all that. 
Anandamide receptors are typically found more in the uh, outer part of the body where nerve cells connect with muscles, not just in humans, but in other animals. Having discovered the anandamide receptor and uh, the CB1 type of receptor that, that the anandamide slots into, now it began to make sense why marijuana, or the THC in marijuana, would uh, affect things. Further on, we discovered a second type of uh, cannabinoid receptor, CB2, and turns out another neurotransmitter, 2AG, was found that slots into that. Recently, there's been reports of 2AGE, NADA, OAE, and LPL, uh, none of which I have any real information for you other than we think there are a large number of other neurotransmitters that affect other systems in the body and which various cannabinoids slot into. Cannabinoids in marijuana, at least 113 different cannabinoids, have been isolated from marijuana. Notice another book, another authority, another number. But, and without trying to pronounce all of these, CBG, CBC, uh, CBN. CBD is the one that has been tested and for medicinal properties and seems to have some medicinal properties. THC is the one that gets people high. Uh, CBE, CBL, and CBT have all been researched briefly, but we still don't have a good understanding of what uh, these cannabinoids, of uh, what uh, neurotransmitters they may connect to, what receptor types, and so on. Uh, recently, I saw a, an article that one of the um, pharmaceutical companies had found a way to extract large enough quantities of CBG to begin testing it to see what it might do. I think over time, we're going to see not only these 100 plus uh, different cannabinoids isolated, but also the ability to create a large number of synthetic cannabinoids and see what they may do to the, in the human nervous system. Could there be more cannabinoids? This is something new I only came across in the last couple of weeks. Not only do there seem to be more cannabinoids, there seem to be subtypes of the various cannabinoids. Italian researchers have identified several different variations of THC and CBD, THC and THCP and THCV, and two subtypes of CBD, CBD and CBDP. Uh, some of those, uh, for example, the THCP uh, subtype is about 30 times as strong as the common THC. So how many, much of these subtypes, the proportions, uh, that are found in a particular strain of plants could account for a great deal of the reason some strains are stronger than others. I suspect as this research goes on, it's likely more cannabinoids will be discovered in the future, and the various percentages of these varieties of CBD and THC and, and the other cannabinoids will explain why various strains of marijuana show various effects may also allow for the production of pure uh, cannabinoids and pure um, subtypes of cannabinoids, which may have a significantly greater medical effect. Warning, there were new 2018 laws, which I think many people missed uh, about the status of marijuana here in California. I suspect these kinds of laws are going to move to other states and be enacted across the country. Despite all the discussion about recreational and medical use of marijuana, my experience is the majority of smokers are smoking marijuana because they want to get high. That high impairs their driving skills and makes it less safe for the rest of us to be out on the road when the heavy marijuana smoker is driving. Effective January 1st, 2018, marijuana use in vehicles. It is illegal to smoke or ingest marijuana or any marijuana product
while driving a motor vehicle upon a highway or while riding as a passenger in a motor vehicle being driven upon a highway. In addition, state law prohibits the possession of an open container of cannabis or cannabis product while operating a motor vehicle. I haven't seen a lot of arrests along this line, but I suspect uh, in the future we are going to see more and more people cited or arrested for having marijuana in the passenger compartment. Point is, if you have marijuana, uh, keep it in the trunk, keep it locked up, uh, don't even park your car on the street in front of your house and go out there to smoke, or you may be subject to uh, criminal penalties. Chapter 11, Marijuana. Terminology matters. So were any of these terms new to you? If you don't know the words, the vocabulary, it's hard to do well on the tests. We talked about tea pads, which were a historical development during Prohibition, places and hotels that people could go to smoke marijuana and other uh, cannabis products. We talked about a motivational syndrome when people simply lose their desire to accomplish anything in life. We've talked about cannabinoids and how this is an emerging field of research and there's more we don't know probably than what we do know. We talked about hash oil, hashish, or honey oil, which are concentrated resins uh, much stronger than the THC content you would see in the raw marijuana. Talked about a joint, THC, the part of the marijuana that appears to get people high, and CBD, another cannabinoid in marijuana, which appears to have medicinal properties. So what should the student have learned as a result of this video and reading the chapter 11 of our textbook? That early use of the cannabis plant, uh, particularly in America and particularly in the northern states, was largely for fiber. In the wild, the strongest strains were found in warmer climates where they produce more resin and more THC. It's important to note that uh, breeders have produced strains by collecting the seeds of the bigger, taller, stronger plants that produce large levels of THC even in cold climates. Hemp plants were grown in the colonial U.S. for fiber. Marijuana continues to be on the Schedule I federally illegal, which creates a lot of conflicts in our laws between the federal government, state, and local governments. THC is the ingredient in marijuana, the cannabinoid, that gets people intoxicated. CBD has some medicinal properties, but excessive use of CBD may also have some dangers. I hope this has given you a little bit of information about marijuana. I'm sure that our knowledge in this area will continue to grow uh, as more and more research is now able to be done with its uh, less illegal status.